Daphne Caruana Galizia. She set off in her car from her home on the beautiful island of Malta on the 16th of October last year. And before she had traveled more than 200 meters, the bomb that had been placed under the driver's seat exploded, killing her instantly. Daphne Caruana Galizia was an investigative journalist, and she was murdered just for doing her job. I'm Jane Wyatt from the European Centre for Press and Media Freedom, and I want to talk today about the theme of the power of attraction, because the power of attraction is mostly about people. It's hard to attract people to an idea, especially an abstract idea like press and media freedom. After all, we are free, aren't we? And who even reads the printed press these days? Dead tree newspapers, so last century, really. It was back in the last century when I started my journalistic career in the northwest of England in a, a place called Manchester. And my first big story was really huge, and it opened my eyes in a nasty way to what press freedom really means. My country, Great Britain, got involved in a conflict with Argentina about the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic, also known as Las Malvinas. That's for the Argentinians in the audience. And because uh, we are a patriotic nation, British journalists were also expected to be patriotic rather than objective. So we would sit in the newsroom receiving the news as it came in from the conflict zone, from trusted sources such as, for example, the PA, the Press Association, still a major respected and very respectable world news agency. And as the news came off the teleprinter, from, from the war, from the South Atlantic, from how our boys were getting on fighting the Argies, we could see very, very clearly, because this was the days before the internet, that words had been blacked out, literally scored through in black, so that, for instance, names, places, operational details, fair enough, there's a war going on, but also lots of other information uh, and opinion and commentary and political perspectives all blacked out with the census pen directly as they came off the teleprinter. Some of my colleagues were involved uh, in traveling to the Falkland Islands as the task force of ships steamed towards the South Atlantic. And they were trying their best, against all this censorship, to report objectively, to tell the facts as they had found them, and to collect different opinions and to show different perspectives. One of them, Kim Sabido at Independent Radio News, was very frustrated by the Ministry of Defense minder. And in the end, he got into such a row with this Ministry of Defense minder that the minder threatened to throw his typewriter overboard into the ocean. Then later on, I too got an opportunity to join in with reporting this war on the ground. I traveled to the Falkland Islands, and I too had a Ministry of Defense minder. Luckily, as a woman, I was able to give him the slip by saying I was very tired after all the um, yomping around from, from various different important spots in the battlefields. Uh, so I went to bed early, so he thought, and in fact I slipped out and I met some civilian Falkland Islanders who were able to give me their perspectives. Uh, and I was able to record them and include them in my reporting when I got back and away from the watchful gaze of those MOD minders. And freedom for Falkland Islanders in the, uh, at that, that really difficult time, what it really meant to them was not having any troops on the island, not Argentinians, not British, just the freedom to live their ordinary way of life as they always had done. And what does freedom mean to us here in the European Union? We are free, aren't we? We have free elections, we have free referenda, 
We are free to use the internet as much as we like, and to, to uh, go on whatever sites we like, and we have press freedom, enshrined here in the European Charter of Press Freedom, which is one of the founding documents of our center. Did you realize, by the way, that the European Center for Press and Media Freedom is based here? This is its world headquarters here in Leipzig. So these freedoms we take for granted, however, are not to be taken for granted, even here in the European Union. I've already mentioned what happened to Daphne Caruana Galizia. Shortly afterwards, in February this year, Jan Kuczak was murdered, along with his fiancée, in the home that they share, shared in Slovakia. It was a classic mafia hit. One bullet in the head, one bullet in the heart. And that was because Jan Kuczak had been investigating links between the mafia, between organized crime with its roots in, uh, in parts of Italy, and the government and the big business interests in Slovakia where he worked. In Italy itself, no fewer than 28 journalists have been murdered by the mafia since 1960. And this is a commemorative memory wall panel created by our partners, the European Center for Press and Media Freedom's partner in Rome, Ossigeno per l'Informazione. It remembers them as 28 names and only one story. And it's still going on. Another car bomb went off in Montenegro. It didn't kill the journalist who was thought to be the target, Sayed Sadikovic. One of his colleagues, was shot in the leg. Again, typical trademark mafia warnings. Stay away. Don't investigate. Let's cover up these murky dealings uh, which the, the journalists were trying to investigate. So when I talked to Sayed Sadikovic, I said, you've had this car bomb outside your apartment. Now is the time when you need some protection. Why aren't you going to the police to ask for protection? You know what? He laughed. He said, there's no point in journalists asking for police protection in Montenegro. In Montenegro, journalists need protecting from the police. That's how bad it is. So, but they can shoot people, they can plant car bombs, but they still can't stop the quest for truth, which is the hallmark of quality journalism, of investigative journalism. And although Daphne Caruana Galizia sadly lost her life, almost immediately, 45 other journalists sprang into action and decided that they would continue the work that she was doing, investigating offshore bank accounts, corrupt dealings, the murky money laundering systems that go on between Malta and Azerbaijan and other places, and how they are linked to the political fortunes and the business empires of the people that she was trying to investigate. So the Daphne project proved that you can kill the journalist, you can kill the messenger, but you can't kill the truth. And it's an extraordinary project because normally, Journalists, newspapers, TV channels, they're very individual people. They're competitive. They like to have scoops and exclusives. But here, in a unique collaboration, here they all got together. They shared their information. They used data journalism and the very latest technical and digital means to uh, make sure that everyone involved was given all the information that they needed, but all the sources were properly protected. And that's also very, very important. So the Daphne project is a way in which Daphne Caruana Galizia lives on, and the spirit of investigative journalism continues. And we're proud to support and help projects like the Daphne project. And in fact, we have our own fund to uh, which investigative journalists can bid for, to work across national boundaries in truly 
European ways to make sure that quality journalism continues even under such deadly threats. Of course, it's not only guns and bombs that we have to fear. There are a lot of bad laws as well. For example, one of the laws which was pursuing Daphne Caruana Galizia is known as a SLAP lawsuit. The SLAP acronym refers to all kinds of really vicious and self-motivated defamation cases, which aim to silence the journalist, which aim to cover up the, the murky dealings of the wealthy and powerful, and to make sure that investigative journalism does not succeed. So, there have been anti-slap legislations brought in front of the European Parliament, and the Parliament is also working hard to offer better conditions and legal protections for whistleblowers, who are really crucial sources. I'm sure you've all heard of Edward Snowden. Um, terrible things happen to whistleblowers also in Europe. Um, and you can look on the ECPMF website next week to find out the fate of another one who we're supporting. So there's the whistleblower directive, there's the anti-slap law, and there are many other moves going on at the European level and also at national level with our support, also through our partner organizations, to challenge and to advocate for better laws. And some of the places where these really bad laws exist might be quite surprising to you. You've probably been there on your holidays. They're lovely sunny places like Italy, Spain, Greece, Croatia, Malta, of course, and Turkey. Right now, in Turkey, more than 150 journalists and writers are incarcerated in jail. And this is a situation that's been going on for years. Because even though in, even in Turkey, journalism is not a crime. The Turkish government takes the view that the people it has locked up are not journalists, but terrorists. One of them, Nadine Chenet, you can see him here in the center. He was in prison for a long time, did several stretches. In one of them, he wrote a book. He said, you cannot jail the truth. That was the title of the book. And when he got out, he was invited to Leipzig to receive this prize, the prize for the freedom and future of the media, given annually by the Media Foundation of the Sparkasse Leipzig, one of our founding fathers here at the European Center for Press and Media Freedom. And Nadim Chenet is one of six recent recipients of this prize, which gives you an indication of how far Turkey has to go on the road to press and media freedom. But Leipzig has always been a place where freedom of expression was important. And it was so important that in 1989, it was one of the major demands of the demonstrators who took to the streets in Leipzig and other cities of, the, of East Germany, the German Democratic Republic. And they were demanding democracy, human rights, including the right to freedom of travel beyond the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, and the right to have a free press. Because a free press is the very oxygen of democracy. So, this was what they called the peaceful revolution and press freedom was at the heart of it. The demonstrators sw swelled out onto the streets, no shots were fired, and they entered the hated Stasi headquarters, the headquarters of the secret police. You may have been there at the Runda Ecker. And now, after the peaceful revolution triumphed and the reunification of West and East Germany succeeded, that place is now a museum.
Mm. Oh. <sighs> well, what just happened to me really happened. Not to me, to a colleague from Azerbaijan, Afghan Mukhtali. He and his family had sought refuge from persistent persecution and censorship. He's an investigative journalist. He was investigating the links between President Aliyev and some of those circles and uh, systems and offshore bank accounts that Daphne Caruana Galizia was also investigating. He thought he'd found a place of safety in the Georgian capital, Tbilisi, but no. Exactly what just happened to me happened to him in May last year. Persons unknown grabbed him, bundled him into a car with a dark bag over his head, and drove him across the border into Azerbaijan, where he was charged with illegally crossing the national border. They also planted some currency on him so that they could charge him as well with currency smuggling. He was in pre-trial detention for months, and at the actual trial, his defense was not called to give evidence. So you can see, we have some very real cases, uh, and this is one of them, that need extra protection and extra agitation and advocacy to, to win the basic human right to write the truth and publish it, and not to live in fear of being imprisoned or murdered. We have won some support for Afghan Mukhtali. In the British House of Commons, MPs have implored the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, you may have heard of him, they've implored him in his dealings with the Azerbaijan government to stick up for human rights, not only for Afghan Mukhtali, but for all the other dissidents uh, and troublemakers who are trying to hold to account the Aliyev's regime. Those MPs also pleaded for clemency when Afghan Mukhtali's sister and niece mysteriously died on New Year's Eve in their apartment at home. They asked for him to be allowed permission to attend the funeral of those family members, and that wasn't granted. But then later, we kept up the pressure, we kept on advocating. Later, there was a memorial service, and Afghan was allowed out of jail to go to the memorial service for his sister and the children. And while he was there, two Georgian journalists managed to film, secretly of course, at three o'clock in the morning with a smartphone, an interview with Afghan Mutali about his abduction, and take it back to Georgia and put it on the TV, on Rustavi 2 TV station. Uh, and this is a TV station that has continually campaigned for justice for Afghan, to find out who these kidnappers were who paid them, who knew what was going on, and why. Why he couldn't be left to report and, and uh, do his normal job as a journalist. And that's why they wear these black hoods on TV in solidarity with Afghan Mukhtali. That's a case that's particularly blatant of press freedom being trampled in countries which aspire to be partners of the European Union, which are talking uh, right now about gas pipelines, visa liberalization, new railway links, closer ties with the European Union, with Western Europe. But they're obviously not sticking up for our European values of press and media freedom. But this is just one case amongst hundreds of others which the European Centre for Press and Media Freedom is proud to support. I hope we've won some of you.